My name is Dylan Handrich. Uh, we're on Prairie Monarch Bison Ranch, uh, about five miles north of uh, Laramie. We're grass-fed uh, and grass-finished bison operation. Raise bison from birth on all the way through and deliver uh, a finished product with a processing facility. And uh, yeah, it's a true farm to table operation. We have two uh, pivots that have alfalfa, uh, alfalfa grass mix. There's uh, clover in there too. Um, and that's uh, forage for the winter, so we'll basically make a hay out of that. Sheila Bird Farms and the Herb House uh, lease. Uh, all about an acre of land over here and they raise uh, vegetables and sell the farmers market as well as uh, to a few local restaurants and then uh, the herb house. Non-crop habitats. I guess we have uh, a slough where there is oh, some old oxbows from the Laramie River and there's all kinds of aquatic uh, wildlife in there. Um, bunch of rushes, reeds, uh, different plants that aren't uh, present on the top dry areas. Um, got some uh, high dry land pasture that only receives uh, you know, rainfall. And that primarily is uh, you know, buffalo grass and blue grama. Um, and then we have irrigated pastures. With your question about uh, cropland versus non-cropland, I kind of see those things as we need to be growing crops and having uh, ecosystems for wildlife on the same land. Uh, for example, these uh, alfalfa fields, there's a bunch of different grasses, there's clover and there's alfalfa, which has roots that'll go down you know, 15 feet on drought years. It'll be still pulling moisture up. Um, and even those, you know, they're, they're crops, but there's a bunch of different uh, ecosystems going on out there and you know, the antelope will come in there right after we uh, hay the fields so they can see all around and then they're grazing off that very you know, fresh regrowth um, so it's not necessarily uh, yeah, my, my take on it is monocultures uh, are not good for promoting ecosystems and if you have a diverse multiple things going um, it supports you know all life on the property which is good for overall production. The largest factor I would say is uh, rain, I mean, moisture. Uh, you take a dry year versus a wet year and you can see uh, you know, the difference in you know, how tall the grass comes up to all the other ecosystems that are affected by that and other species. Uh, so. Water is the largest factor, I would say. How the habitats affect water. Yeah. Um, in a positive way, the, the bit of runoff that we do have um, from flood irrigation um, doesn't have pesticides, herbicides, um, or any commercial fertilizers because of you know, the organic practices here. Wherever we put water, we're, we're increasing the life and biodiversity of that area. We've had areas that we hadn't received uh, irrigation water for you know, the edges of fields uh, that were previously irrigated and then went and turned into dry land pasture and then came back uh, irrigated after a number of years. And um, just to see the difference year to year and the change of uh, grasses that'll be there and the production of those grasses and then the wildlife that comes in and utilizes that. Oh, we have a uh, you know, number, a couple of different species of deer, elk, and moose that come, come across here for uh, large wildlife. Uh, there's a number of uh, smaller predators, foxes, coyotes, um, badgers, um, and then the rodents um, as well. And they all um, are part of this and all bring back to it. And since you know, we are producing bison, they are the uh, native uh, large grazers of this land and I feel that those uh, all kind of work together and there's probably uh, I like there's definitely know there's uh, more to more to it than I can you know understand on how all those interactions 
work together to positively benefit the, the habitat. I have uh, five hives, um, they're right over here. And as far as, uh, you know, there is a big bee die off, uh, you know, and it's still, I guess, questioning where and why all that's happening. Um, you know, one of the things is the spraying of uh, pesticides and really I've worked with the, uh, the city of Laramie to limit their spraying uh, here. One of the reasons is to protect the uh, bees. Um, and then uh, also creating uh, you know, many different uh, flowers and uh, things that bees can go out and harvest. So I've heard that we could have many more hives than, than we actually do or support many more based on the actual uh, you know, acreage and production, but it's a hobby. Canadian thistle is, uh, you know, a very invasive weed. It's on the, the list of the county, I think even the federal, uh, it's an invasive or noxious weed. Um, you know, there's, there's funding out there if you'll go and spray it. Um, my take on getting rid of that is using gall flies. It's a fly that you know, lays an egg on the, the plant and then there's a larva. It creates this big, you know, uh, blistery looking thing on the stem and uh, weakens the plant and um, oh, ultimately doesn't allow it to uh, reproduce that year. And so it's kind of a uh, um, competition, even, you know, and there's a whole bunch of the uh, thistles, there's a, you know, increase in the gall flies and then when the thistles go, you know, the population drops, then the, so do the gall flies. It's not a thing where we can ever really eradicate the thistles entirely, but it's one way to keep them in control. Though there are some, you know, benefits to thistle. You know, if there's a area that has been disturbed, uh, they're usually one of the first weeds that comes in, and they've got really deep roots. They hold that in place, and uh, they pull nutrients from really deep um, to the surface, so that the grasses can actually uh, use them. And then any other weeds, it's just a matter of uh, monitoring, uh, either hand pulling, um, mowing, burning, combination, um, just researching what it is and how to, how to deal within it in a uh, natural way without chemicals. We'd like to move more towards uh, you know, doing on-farm uh, harvests. That way there's not that extra stress of transporting the animal right at the, you know, Few hours before slaughter, um, so we won't be moving, and uh, hopefully we'll be there, you know, within a year or so. But transporting takes uh, you have a refrigerated trailer and uh, all the USDA requirements on that.